This episode, I'm joined once again by Matthew Lewis Sutton to discuss his new book, Compassionate Presence, The Trinitarian Spirituality of Adrienne von Speer, alongside discussions on theodrama and spiritual loneliness. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paying patrons and subscribers for making all this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast and keep everything running, please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So Matthew Lewis Sutton, thanks once again for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, we are, it's been two years, uh, we were saying, just before we started recording, it's been about two years since we last spoke um, about uh, Adrienne von Speer and her Trinitarian uh, mysticism was the title at that time. And uh, we're back talking about von Speer, about your latest book, Compassionate Presence, The Trinitarian Spirituality of Adrienne von Speer, which has been uh, published by Angelico Press. And it's actually touching on something which I think near the end of our last discussion, it was something I brought up because it was almost like a uh, uh, something that wasn't able to be fit in that text at the time and was like, this is something we need to dip into. And also you basically said, it's not something I could fit in because she writes about it in such depth, which mm. was actually the question of hell. But yeah. uh, so this book is it's a strange little book so it's different to your last one and we were talking about this once again before we start recording it's very personable it draws on loneliness it draws on mm -hmm. christ's descent it draws on hell it draws on compassion mary and of course the the theology and uh, spirituality of von Speer. um but before we before we jump in um yeah i mean how, how did uh how did you come to write another book on, on Von Speer? How did this one be begin to be formed? My goodness, yeah. I, I love uh, our conversation from the, the previous time, and I really wanted to um, share what uh, I was writing in this in this new manuscript. I'm so grateful that we get another ch chance to uh, to meet and, and go further into Adrian's uh, spirituality. And that really, I wanted to write one book that engages in her theology, her spirituality of Holy Saturday, the, the day of Christ's descent to hell. We have the uh, Good Friday of Jesus on the cross, and uh, he's taken down from the cross on, on Friday in the afternoon and laid in, laid in the tomb. And then there's these, uh, in uh, the, the tradition, 40 hours that he's in the tomb when he rises on um uh, on early dawn uh, on Sunday morning, so these these forty hours of of silence, these three days, um, this Holy Saturday silence. Oh, what is what is this? And Adrian's uh, spirituality, uh, you know, delves into this moment. Um, and so, I really wanted to construct a, a whole um, systematic theology based on this this one idea. So. Uh, in my academic uh, world, uh, systematic theology is attempting to, in a sense, write a, uh, write a, con a constructive theology um, that addresses uh, God, the human person, um, the the church, uh, the the saints, grace, sacraments, um, spirituality, uh, prayer, eternity, uh, all these you know fundamentally big things of speaking to the world today, um, and. A lot of times that gets um, uh, dismissed as uh, something that cannot be done anymore today in a, in a postmodern world. Uh, con constructions are are being dismantled, and there's uh, no desire for another con another construction. Um, and in, and in the face of that, I understand that some of the so many of the you know big systematic theologies that are are were constructed, yeah, should rightly f fall apart. Um, uh, Friedrich Schleimacher, for example, writes from the beginning of, uh, in his sense, human experience, and it's only um, in the appendix of this massive Christian faith volume that he speaks about the Trinity. And so it, we start with experience and then uh, move to our our experience of God, then last is, is Trinity. And th rightly so, that just doesn't feel uh, like it's a, a, a solid ground or articulation of who who uh, God is, who Christ is. And so I wanted to speak you know, to this world today, the importance of uh, of Christian faith and what's the entryway. And so lo loneliness became this, this um, bridge 
uh, that I could seize on, a, a hook uh, that could start a conversation. And well, how do we a- a- approach Christianity to this, you know, world of uh, uh, of of loneliness? And so, Holy Saturday is that is that moment. I think that Christianity can speak uh, to this world. Um, so I was just thinking about uh, how. Uh, you know, there's been so many uh, rises uh, and epidemics um, articulated. One of them that often gets unnoticed is the the kind of epidemic of loneliness. Um, so, uh, you know, for UK has a minister of loneliness. Uh, the United States has just released the Surgeon General just released uh, a whole study on the epidemic of loneliness. You know, coming out of um, the pandemic uh, and the you know uh, forced isolation of of humanity from each other uh, has had serious and will continue to have serious implications. Uh, the The unfolding of society was occurring already before that, uh, but this accelerated in so many ways. You know, if you look at like the rise of uh, uh, people taking uh, antidepressants has gone um, uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, in some age groups, especially older age groups, almost up to 20% of the population is taking antidepressants. And I un- absolutely understand there's a reason for for these and, and effectiveness of these. Um, but there's something of uh, a kind of failure of our, our societal mental health uh, when this is the, the thing that we as a, a large segment of society reach to. Suicide um, has, you know, sadly been really increasing at least in the the united states i'm not sure about the the uk and europe but i imagine uh very similar um you know it's uh you know risen in the last couple of years by almost 36 percent um you know so in in our age uh i i keep coming back to mother Teresa, what she says about our age loneliness and the feeling of being unwanted is the most terrible poverty uh and and this is the poverty of of this this age and so what does Christianity speak to this age of loneliness? And I see Adrian's spirituality of Holy Saturday as that, that thing that Christians can say to this world. Mm-hmm. God has entered into the most extreme of loneliness, hell, this isolation mm-hmm. from himself. This, so, yeah, I mean, I believe the statistics for the UK are um, even worse regarding antidepressants. I think we're at something about... I think it may actually even be near thirty forty. I think it's 40. higher. I think it's higher than that. Gosh. But then again, we're living in the UK, so it's understandable, mm-hmm. right? Um, <laughs> where it rains all the time. But I think I think um, there is there's a, there's so much in that the presumptions of antidepressants, which is um, I think frustrating for anyone who's delved into philosophy or th- or theology, because there's sort of this materialist presumption regarding what makes us happy what makes us sad so on the one hand we'll or lonely on the one hand we'll admit that it's we'll accept that it's uh, affection love feeling which are the things which really make you feel well mm. loved um mm-hmm. cared for and not lonely but then on the other hand we'll somehow deem that some sort of material mm-hmm. alteration of our chemicals will change things and whether or not this is effective it seems to be that no one really wants to tackle the true root of what these problems might very well be, which is something which clearly isn't physiological in that sort of chemical sense of like, oh, if we just if we just flip this switch, then everything will be fine. Well, clearly that isn't true because it's not as if this percentage number of people who are depressed, lonely, etc., is going down. So it seems to me that the basis is found somewhere else. Um, but I guess before heading forward, this book has a, sort of a relationship with also something else you're involved in called uh, con, consola- Consolatio. 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 So, and, and that's some, as I understand it, that was something to do with sort of communal loneliness and. and th- yeah. That um, yeah. Thank you for mentioning. So, uh, in uh, 2008, uh, when I moved to uh, New York City, um, uh, Consolatio, which used to be called uh, Hearts Home, um, it was started in France as uh, Le Point Que, uh, Hearts Home. Uh, but now, through uh, various changes, um, they call themselves Consolatio. Uh, they reached out to me uh, because of my research on Adrienne. They are a, um, a community founded on Adrienne's uh, spirituality and uh, Catherine Doherty. 
who organized um, uh, uh, community, uh, small communities to aid uh, aid each other in li- you know living out a life of of love and compassion and opening openness to the the poor and how best to serve the poor. And so this community consolatio um, it organizes volunteers, usually young adults, um, that then they send to uh, various. Uh, poor communities throughout the world, and there are nineteen, um, twenty, uh, ni- or well, uh, nineteen countries. Uh, they've had to leave Ukraine uh, because of of the war, but um, they uh, make their community um, and do visits and offer a ministry of compassion. They're creating a culture of compassion, uh, and so um, they offer what they call friendship. Um, so there's no other uh, program. Um, of evangelization other than offering friendship um, to see another um, and to go to the places where people aren't being seen. Um, so uh, women's shelters um, here in New York and the, the projects in uh, downtown uh, Brooklyn, um, wh- wherever there's there's loneliness, that's where uh, they um, they feel they need they need to be sent. And they offer then friendship. So they do visits uh uh, with people holding them and, and and caring for them, and I tell one story of one missionary, um, Marion, in the in the book of her being in a um, hospital, and she hears somebody crying down the hallway, and she goes to that room. May may I come in? And she says, No, I don't want to see anybody uh, get away. Like, well, it sounds like you're in 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 pain. Can I help you with anything? Um, could I sit by your bedside? No, I don't want you to sit by my bed. Oh well, then I'll just sit in this chair. And so she sits in the chair and, um, you know, starts a conversation with her. And then eventually she's able to move to the bed. And eventually, could I hold hold your hand? And so she starts to hold the hand. And and you know, this woman who had been crying and um, uh, desperately lonely now feels comforted. And they sing together uh, some old Broadway songs. And then she she falls asleep and. Um, in peace, and so then she goes and visits, you know, weekly uh, to see this this woman. So this is the ministry of friendship of of overcoming loneliness, not through, like you said, materialism, uh, medications, but through presence, through friendship. And so my experience with them, you know, is really uh, this book is honoring uh, what I see them working out and living out. How would how would you just out of interest? How would you define loneliness? And what do you think the, the proper definition of loneliness really should be? Yeah, I think I think theologically, it's um, ultimately isolation uh, from God, from the source of life. Uh, but then sociologically, it's uh, isolation, either by choice or by force, uh, from uh, being in relationship with with others. But even more so, um, and I get into this at, at, in the first chapter. Uh, there's a loneliness within our own selves. Uh, we ourselves are, are are strange to ourselves. We don't. Uh, recognize ourselves, and so I offer um, Julia Kristeva's uh, uh, philosophy to, you know, uh, speak about that isolation. That who who am I to to my own self? I uh, and there there's a you know a, a Christian way of understanding this with Paul. I do these things I I do not want to do. There's this separation even from w- one's own self, um, and so on on so many levels, um, philosophically, s- societally. Um, Theologically, uh, you know, loneliness is is foundational to the the Christian message that God is a God of compassion, of communion, of of uh, taking uh, our loneliness, our um, suffering, our isolation into Himself uh, to bring about His His presence as uh, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I guess then to to use this as a segue to really open up the the von Speer theology, which is taking place within your book, hell then is the is the ultimate loneliness, the the you know eternal separation mm-hmm. from God. And is this is this what it predominantly is for von Speer, or is this something that you developed from von Speer? Why does she really begin mm. there with why, yeah. why is why, I mean I guess why is Christ's descent to hell so important? Is it because of that? Yeah, I. You know, uh, hell within um, uh, Judaism and, and Christianity is understood in many different ways. Um, in the uh, New Testament times, uh, the description of of hell comes out of Jewish uh, apocalyptic literature, 
And so it understands that Sheol, the underworld, uh, is located geographically underneath the temple. Um, and so when the, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, when, uh, you know, Christ is on a cross and screams his last, last breath, uh, the earthquake happens and the temple veil is torn in two and the spirit, the spirits rise. So there she hold is understood as this kind of populace of the, um, of the, of the underworld where all go to, you know, wait the coming, coming of the Messiah. But also within, uh, Christianity, especially uh, in Augustine's depiction of hell, uh, hell is this um, uh, removal of of uh, relativity to others. Uh, because I es- establish a, a a relationship of of truth when I'm with someone else. Um, you know, he thinks he in the conversation with with Monica, uh, he uh, he has this experience of God, but when he's, you know, removed and isolated from himself and, and from others, this is the kind of hell. And so in his depictions of hell, it's greater and greater separation from any relativity, uh, to, uh, to others and especially to ultimately God. So a kind of nothingness, um, C.S. Lewis, you know, talks about it, uh, in his, uh, gray town and, and the great divorce as people moving further and further away from each other, uh, and, and when anybody becomes too close, then you move again and again, farther and farther from from each other. So, um, so rather than a depiction of uh, uh, I don't know, lakes of fire, it's uh, uh, the the sadness of I, of isolation, uh, chosen uh, by myself that I don't want to be in relationship with God and with and with others, and the solitude. Um, that I desire is the solitude I end up getting, and my myself just starts to fall away from from it being what it what it ultimately needs a relationship. So that that is in uh, Adrian's understand. So that that last is Adrian's understanding of hell, uh, a separation from God and separation from from each other and the torment of being alone. So I guess how how is it and why was it that Christ Descended to hell? Did he have to? Did he have to descend to hell? Was this was this a choice? Is there, you know, it's uh, God going down to hell mm-hmm. or something happening yeah. there? I mean, what's what's happening within that whole? I guess we're getting into dogmatics in a way, but what's the the yeah. anchor around the theological anchor around which von Spear is really moving away from in terms of what's happening in that event with with Christ? Yeah. Yeah, this is, I think, some of the most profound stuff in her in her spirituality. I'll just take one little step back to help your um, audience just remember. So uh, there's a major tradition within uh, Christian theology of uh, Christ descent to hell, as that it's a a, uh, a descent in victory, a now one redemption where he goes down to the the underworld um, to release the saints. Uh, that have gone be- before him, awaiting the gates of heaven to be opened by him. So it's a a, a descent of triumph um, to bring those souls from um, from the dead up to eternal life with with God forever. That's the major tradition, especially preserved in um, the Eastern Orthodox uh, theologies. But there is this minor tradition. Uh, you can see it in a um, first century uh, sermon. Uh, from Syrian Christians, uh, from the Syrian Christian community, uh, that talks about it as a time of saw, uh, that this descent of Christ to hell is a time of, of, of silence and of suffering. So the, the continuation of, of the cross, the continuation of the, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? So this continues his, his abandonment. Uh, and, and understood from, from this angle, this is Adrian's, uh, spirituality of, Christ, uh, or the, the Son has been sent to take on the whole of the whole of humanity to redeem what is humanity as uh, God had created it. So he takes on everything but sin. And so in taking on the whole of our human experience, he takes on you know, every aspect of that human experience, even our isolation from God and from himself. Uh, so that is you know, the, the depths of his, uh, uh, redemption is that he doesn't, you know, redeem us at our perfection or our slightly goodness, but he goes to the, the depths of our loneliness and there speaks a yes to God. Um, 
we can see it in the temptations in the desert where he is um, alone, isolated, and the devil is tempting him the, the three times, the three challenges. And, you know, him saying, man does not live by bread alone. You shall, you know, only worship the Lord, your God. And he he survives those 40 days in the desert. Well, th- that gives us a, a kind of theological insight into the 40 hours of the of the the time in hell, the that where he is speaking uh, his faith in the Father, even in this isolation, uh, isolationing abandonment from from the Father. Uh, it, and to be clear, it's uh, her um, Trinitarian theology is Orthodox, so she's not understanding that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit become separated, objective entities. Not at all. Uh, this is a subjective um, experience of abandonment, so to speak. Um, so she talks about the, that phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When before he was speaking about the father, but now God has become so distant from him. It's no longer father, it's God. Uh, so so even in the son, he's understanding the separation from uh, from what he knew as, as his father. So taking on the whole of our, our human experience, even, uh, you know, even to the dead. And uh, you know, she has a wonderful meditation on Psalm uh, 139. Uh, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, the underworld, hell, you are there. Uh, that he is in heaven and yet he's also uh, in hell. We cannot flee from from his presence, even though we may try. Uh, he is He is there. So would every would everyone be saved for von Spee? Um, so I I think Adrian is more clear about this than Balthasar. Um, for for those that um, may know, uh, there is a kind of controversy around Balthasar's uh, theology coming out of a book called "Dare We Hope uh, That All Men Be Saved," and I and I think he he does stay in orthodox christianity as far as the the answer but he pushes it uh to its utmost extreme that um the redemptive power of christ can mean that all are saved does it mean that we do not know but can it yes the redemptive power of christ can and so adrian's a little more clear in that she does understand that there are those that are in hell, but it's because they have um, uh, 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 opposed God to the to the absolute point of uh, wanting to be separated from Him for eternity, and there's a knowing of that of that choice that they've made. Um, so, you know, for her, it's a little more clear that uh, you know, while yes, the the redemptive power is. But at the same time, she understands that there are there are those that have chosen that eternal damnation knowingly. Mm-hmm. And there's another there's another sort of alongside this discussion on hell. There's another discussion which is sort of running tangential throughout the book in a way, which is your you're constantly bringing in postmodernism. You're bringing in a lot of big discussions in terms of, well, you're tackling a lot of really big discussions. I mean, in relation to what we've already spoken about with loneliness, um, in, in the sense that we now have hell as an understanding of moving away from compassion. Um, you know, almost the story you gave there of Marianne of moving away from that woman would be hell, moving away from the other in philosophical terms. And you, you bring in a lot of big questions regarding value truth meaning in the Mm. postmodern world and why was this so important alongside this discussion of loneliness and compassion to really uh to really get to grips with postmodernism as something that is obviously in that discussion causing some problems i love it um you know uh i i became a, a theologian uh to speak to people today uh and Growing up in um, uh, or, or learn, going through graduate school, a lot of Christian uh, theologians go to learning theology to speak to the the previous generation's problem, because that's who they're reading. They're reading previous theologians dealing with uh, that age's um, problems. 
Uh, and so oftentimes there's a lack of courage to speak to people today in a way that they can uh, can understand. And so I want to force myself into how are people writing uh, uh, today um, and how can Christianity speak to speak to today? Um, and and that's that's a very daunting uh, task, uh, as you well know, to engage in any kind of postmodernism because they, uh, so postmodernists themselves, you know, disagree with each other, and and it's not this one thing; it's it's many things. But uh, I feel like I can participate in this conversation around uh, meaning making. Meaning making. Um, this comes from some of the the work I've done earlier on suffering, uh, and so I have a co-edited book on on suffering where it is po- postmodern philosophers and uh, theologians, and you know, from many other disciplines. Um, speaking on this this joint experience of suffering and trying to find commonality. And so m- meaning making is a, a really important uh, a bridging concept between many of these different different schools. and and so my entrance into adding Adrienne's voice, my own voice, to this conversation around meaning making comes from uh, when she says uh, things have meaning only to the extent that they lead to God come from him and can be placed at his service. And and so something of, uh, I think, postmodernism is right in saying human-generated meaning is a a fruitless task. Uh, It can be arbitrary. It can be game-making. It can work for your tribe uh, to generate your tribe's longevity. But how universal is your tribe's meaning-making compared to another tribe's meaning making. Um, you know, you think, uh, I don't know, Taylor Swift is, uh, you know, the the goddess of uh, of all, uh, but others of you think, okay, Justin Bieber is your uh, messiah. Uh, and so those little tribes operate on their own, that's fine, but anyone speaking, you know, tri- across tribes, uh, this is the, in a sense, many ways, the dysfunction of our society, but also it's right. I mean, who is the goddess and god of of pop? Um, but to, to bring it back uh, to to our our theology uh, exchange here, um, yeah, our human endeavors to make meaning can generate a lot of positivity as well as destruction. Uh, and so, is is this a fruitless task? Well, the the Christian message is: No, you're right. It, the the human endeavor. Uh, to make meaning is just another Tower of Babel. But when meaning is brought to us by by the Word of God, this is the, the source uh, of then all meaning. So again, what she said, things have meaning only to the extent that they lead to God, come from Him, and can be placed at His service. And so, you know, this for me is, okay, well, what is the the meaning that God gives to us? And that's His compassionate presence. It's not a, a philosophical school. Uh, it's his being there and sharing our our suffering. Hmm. So how do we how do we compose ourselves a- after postmodernism, which we don't really seem to? It does seem to be in its uh, death stage. Like people are more mm-hmm. nonchalant and just disillusioned with it. Um, but it's a problem because much like uh, many other things, it seems to just consume everything into its because it doesn't have an overarching limitation it can just yeah. churn and churn and churn how do we well, it, how do we get out of that how do we move past that yeah it it ends in in apathy or or in nihilism um uh you know so it 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 will in a sense uh, d- destroy itself uh, but i i think sometimes uh, within christian theology there's a nostalgia for uh returning to modernism because it, Christianity is used to con- constructing, as I said, systems or constructing, um, you know, o- uh, overarching uh, constructions and ideas, uh, great cathedrals of thought. And while that's amazing and wonderful, but to to speak to people today, uh, you know, what will come next? I don't know. I can't uh, predict, but I can speak to the people today that are choosing isolation from each other, not just. Uh, society self-inflicting it, like the imposed pandemic, but also more and more people choosing to isolate themselves, so not entering into uh, lifelong relationships with with others, like uh, in marriage, for example, or belonging to communities or affiliating with a religion. Um, 
uh, you know, there's this wonderful book I mentioned at the beginning, Bowling Alone. So the going to the bowling alley to bowl, uh, you know, bowl by yourself, becoming a more and more chosen thing by the the younger generations to to isolate themselves further and further from from each other. Um, Christianity needs to speak to that today. Uh, and what I see are the um, uh, ministries of friendship like Consolatio are impacting young people to um, you know, speak to them of their of, of this loving presence that you are loved, you are chosen, your um, your God knows you and He won't abandon you, and that you are. You're his beautiful uh, creation and image that he has made you in, and he wants you to be in relationship with him forever. Uh, how, however, uh, or th this grace of offering presence speaks to the heart of old and and the young, and so we have to find ways to to speak that. and And I think by speaking about, you know, Christ has descended into this solitary isolation of of our hells. Uh, and all the many different hells that we have, um, he is there then offering, offering his presence, his his love, um, as he did with the the woman um, caught in a, an adultery, about to be stoned to death. Here he speaks his presence, as he you know speaks to the Samaritan woman who is so ashamed. Uh, she goes to the well in the afternoon by her, by herself, and where is he? There he is. When the two disciples. Uh, uh, are on their way to Emmaus. Basically, they're running away from Jerusalem because they're afraid to be caught up like Jesus. Jesus is walking with them and speaking with them and then unfolds his presence to them. So he he seeks us out. Uh, I think of the, the uh, prodigal son uh, story of as soon as he sees the uh, son who had abandoned um, the family coming over the hill, the uh, the old man gets up and runs towards uh, his uh, new returning son. Um, you know, there's an old tradition of the the old man's uh, clothes do not um, do not move, meaning uh, the uh, the old man has people come to him. But the the story of uh, that Christ offers in that in that um, parable is that no. God, the the old man runs to us as soon as we make that crest over the hill to to return to him. He he runs towards us, so that's his his compassionate presence. This is the God that speaks, um, in in Jesus and speaks to people today. This this compassionate love. Well, there's there's a there's an interesting question there because postmodern just to jump back to postmodernism, try to draw that draw that in. Postmodernism is sort of this ultimate terminal non-limitation it just keeps going and going and going and then anything goes because everything can be deconstructed or uh you can go a level deeper or you can just yeah deconstruct and, and nothing has this overarching meaning but at the same time you said you know there's almost this um i would even call it a fetishization of returning <laughs> to a very strict modern sort of um dogmatic system and yeah. in this an nostalgia, a nostalgia. A nostalgia. Mm -hmm. and that uh, but i some i mean just personally i i see i often see that nostalgia really not taking the last sort of 100 years of human thought in any sense mm -hmm. seriously and in 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 that way being completely ignorant and actually pushing people away from that mm -hmm. in this sort of capital t traditionalist well that's not how things yeah. are finger wagging but at the same time so it's almost like one hand, that's complete limitation. The other hand, we have non-limitation. But we do need limits. There needs to, there is, we still have this aversion to limitation. But at the same time, there needs to be a limit as shown by Christ in, in the stories that you just mentioned. There has to be this sort of line or place where we can sort of go, right, that's actually an anchor. We can now move forward from something. And mm -hmm. what, I guess the question there is in terms of the compassion that we're talking about, what is this healthy form of limitation, which isn't yeah. ignorant of the world, um, <laughs> but is it, but equally isn't um, doesn't sort of just apathetically lie down and die? In oh, the you're right. Modernist sense. Boy, I, I when I was younger, I was attracted to that kind of uh, uh, traditionalist approach. That screw it, I'm just going back to the way things 
way things were. And I understand the appeal to those kind of uh, communities. I understand that's that's a choice. Uh, but I also love going to uh, the museums and seeing the new exhibitions. And, and there I see um, in so many of them this, I don't know, destruction of, of humanity, destruction of, uh, of of what's good of, of being human. And and it and it just becomes more and more extreme that they're trying to out provoke provoke each other, um, so pro- provocation becomes the the goal rather than depicting the, the the human experience or something beautiful and awe inspiring. And so I I see the end. Um, so one of my favorite chapters in the book is on Mary, uh, and in that in that chapter I speak about Marian uh, freedom. Um, so the, the, the yes that Mary, uh, offers to the angel, um, speaking, you know, to her of this, uh, incarnation that will, uh, of God that will happen. And she says, be it done to me according to your word. And so the, the freedom that she is given, uh, by that angel visit is that there's, she can say no, but so there's a freedom there. She can also say yes in a uh, limited way. So yes, in the ways that I understand it, um, as a, um, a Jewish woman who's been longing for the Messiah. But that's not what she says. Her uh, be it done to me according to your word is a surrendering of the meaning of everything that is happening. So she doesn't say, uh, let it be according to your will. So what you want to do, but according to your word. So that is the way that you will make meaning is coming from you. And I will be here, as it says in the Gospel of Luke, pondering it in my heart uh, three times. Mary ponders this in her heart. So I, I see um, the longing for of postmodernism is for freedom. So freedom from constructions. Um, but that that in itself... Uh, is not the fulfillment of freedom. Freedom is when you make a choice, you know, uh, when you make a choice that this person is my friend, there is the fulfillment of your, of your freedom uh, and the, the ultimate expression of that. And so in, in Mary, we can find uh, this great desire of freedom that she's been given uh, that you as a virgin can now have a child something that is impossible becomes possible with God. And she chooses yes to that, not just according to your will, but according to your word. So you make the meet the complete meaning of this God. And I will ponder this in, in my heart. And so I think that this is where we can find um, the entry, the entry point for uh, beginning, beginning humanity again uh, from this, this new Eve. Mm. I always used to, to joke that, uh, you know, in terms of the the Bible, Mary is really the only person who does what she's told straight away, and she finds the most freedom. Everyone else sort of, you know, yes. has their first moment of, do you really want me to do that, though? There's yeah, the, yeah. No, the no Jonas. Yeah. yeah, the Jonas and the Job. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. um, yeah, uh, there's that human hesitation. We even see it in in, in Jesus. You know, uh, if it's possible, Father, let this chalice pass from me. We we see that he- the hesitancy of the of the human. And uh, Ad- Adrian, you know, talks about that. The hesitancy of the human is even taken by by Christ. The the anxiety of of being human we see in in that moment, and Christ has taken even that into Himself. But yeah, it, it's a Mary that she uh, does not doubt. Uh, and she does not limit her yes. It is a completely open, open yes uh, to the father, even to make meaning of her being the the mother of his son. And I, I think this is from Von Speer. It's just the quote I wrote down. You know, the father saw in Mary that the earth is not a cold, dead place. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, do you feel that? I, do you just on a personal level? Because the book itself is very personal. I mean, do you do you? Do you feel the earth the the earth is a cold dead place at the moment? <laughs> we are falling apart. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> the, the, yeah, we, we um, you know we're a, a fallen humanity, um, and you know 
we've create in our societies and different classes create in their different ways in societies to hide ourselves from that uh, fallenness, to avoid it as much as possible. I mean, which just with the the rise of uh, of addictions and chemical abuse, um, you know, there's a, a kind of medication escapism that's happening in you know modernist societies, but also in in impoverished countries. Uh, there's an ignorance of of the, the the world to the intense poverty that uh, humanity is is still experiencing uh, today, uh, and so we we're failing each other. Um, century after century, we're we're failing each other, and and we'll continue to do so if we're relying only on our only on ourselves. And I mean this this notion, I mean. What the the world is a cold dead place. We now have this sort of uh, foundation and um, trajectory that your book has taken in relation to what it's drawing to take that trajectory. Von Speer's notion of hell, compassion, moving forward through postmodernism, and then you bring in this other really strange thing, which I found absolutely fascinating, which is this notion of theodrama of oh. uh, uh, as 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 the, the the unfolding of history as a sort of theological stage play. Uh, where the son is the actor and the father is the playwright, um, and what, why why is this why do, why is this sort of as a grammar? Why do you think this notion of theodrama is is um, useful to sort of view where where we are and how to progress? Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you picked up on that. So I, I, uh, a book down the road uh, will be a, a, a theo uh, will be on theodrama. Um, so the the word itself comes from Balthasar's uh, major trilogy. So the the second part is called Theodrama. It's a in English it's a five volume set, um, uh, and it is his uh, theological meditation on the transcendental of goodness, uh, of action, of of God choosing the good. But he uses uh, theater as a language to speak of the goodness of of God, um, uh, because it is. Um, like I said, a, a way that humans generate meaning. So when we go to a show, we turn off the lights and we see ourselves and the actors and the world that they present. And out of that, um, meaning is generated. Either uh, in a comedy, everything gets resolved, or in a tragedy, everything falls apart and maybe a moral comes about it, or at least uh, the the feeling of uh, our humanity failing itself is is acknowledged, and so so theater is something so primally human, uh, and so he wants to use that language of theater to then you know uh, offer a whole Christian theology. And so my my uh, use of theodrama comes out of Balthasar. It's the kind of the big Balthasarian moment in, in the book. And what I uh, love about it is that um, it's so trinitarian. And uh, you mentioned some of it. So, uh, in his you know theodramatic theory, the father is the the author of the play, the the son is the actor, the main actor, and then the Holy Spirit is the director. So the director moves the actor and acting the um, author's uh, vision of what this play should be all about. So he drives the the actor from this to that to interact with these things, and and so this this trinitarian unfolding of um, of God on the stage of the world uh, also has us participating in. And so in in theodramatic theory, but also just in um, uh, theatrical theater, the audience is a, a role in every performance. So uh, less so in a movie. So when you're watching a film. Uh, the audience is not involved in the 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 show at all, but in live theater, in live theater, uh, and actors will speak about this, uh, uh, and I myself have done some some theater that when when I'm on the stage, the audience is very much a member of the of the show, um, and certainly there are postmodern productions that integrate that even even further, you know, uh, breaking the that fourth wall. But the the audience participates in the main actor's uh, presence, you know, through through the show, hoping for his good or whatever it might be. Um, and so I I love how um, uh, we can understand salvation history as a uh, as a play as a a theodrama that we are also participating in, whether we know it or not. 
the the unfolding of 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 time uh is the father sending his son to bring the whole story of humanity to this ultimate dramatic moment of the life death and resurrection of Christ and that we are uh in this age in this age of the church or this age of resolution that is the dramatic moment has already happened in time this is Balthasar's uh, theology of history now the, the the most dramatic moment has happened already in history and now it's unfolding uh as a kind of stone that the father throws into the to the lake of 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 humanity has occurred in Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And then the ripple effects are working itself out throughout the rest of the lake, throughout the rest of, of time. And so that the impact of, of the cross uh, ha- has occurred and is working itself out in, in our age, that we are participating in the resolution of the grand theodrama. So this is where the book also brings in sort of the Delphian oracles, the notion of know thyself. So really when we think about that notion of know thyself it's almost like know thy place within within this great drama. in the play yeah know thy yeah. place within the play mm-hmm. so what what are the postmodernists doing are they uh they're watch they're almost watching a tv yeah <laughs> yeah um or they've they've even turned off the tv uh um so you know the postmodernism is they they have the the ticket to the theater but they decided not to go um this show is still happening. Uh, they're just not in in that theater, uh, but they're because of their humanity. They still have that that ticket. Uh, they could be in in that seat. Um, you know, I like the uh, artist uh, Edward Hopper. I'm not sure if you uh, know his work, but he has such a amazing way of depicting loneliness in busyness. So the one that I'm thinking about is. Um, a woman in a in a theater. Uh, it's a you know a large movie theater with many people. You can see kind of in the dark, and the uh, the painting uh, has her dressed in red, standing in an aisle off to the side, uh, head down, uh, alone. Uh, and so she's with everybody, but alone. Uh, and I think this is so right in depicting. Um, our age when we can be surrounded by so many people online, uh, through podcasts, through many different media ways, uh, and yet we can be alone uh, in, the, in the solitary ways of isolation. Well, and I think just just drawing on that, though, I think there's a certain sense of um, physical vulnerability. I mean, especially just working in um, – there's a, yeah, there's a certain sense in the modern world where – physical presence has become conflated with vulnerability and vulnerability itself has been conflated mm-hmm. with some sort of weakness as opposed to some sort of uh, well a uh, place of openness or growth and what i mean by that is i mean it just in terms of running the podcast for so long and looking at other podcasts there's, there's a whole there's, there's there's entire genres now and entire pastimes in a way where or audio and visual media become simply a surrogate friend which you turn on to just have in the room, but you don't really, some people don't even pay attention to media anymore. You just put it on while you do something else or have a podcast on where some people randomly talk. And it's almost like compassion and closeness without any real, like you just sever it, sever it at any moment. And it doesn't matter. But I love it. I I listen to all all these different voices, but what, what is it? I'm choosing it. I'm choosing it. Uh, I'm a, a family man, and I'm surrounded by uh, these lovely, uh, lovely ladies. Uh, and what they say, what they do, is completely uncontrolled by me uh, as their father. Whereas, you know, uh, media, we choose uh, what it is, uh, the voice, the music. Uh, but to be in a relationship with another um, in in person. Um, you know, returns the spontaneity of a relationship. Uh, what you and I are speaking about here has not been written yet. Uh, we are in the moment to experience it uh, happening. And what a what an absolute delight that is as as a human who gets to hear another person say something. I don't know what's going to come next. Uh, and and that's where um, media is not enough. A uh, relationship is ultimately what we need. Uh, a true human speaking to us, seeing us. 
I feel so connected to the different medias that that I listen to and various podcasts and people that I meet. Uh, but it doesn't replace being in the classroom with my students and me speaking and hearing them and the the, the moment that we share. Uh, you know, has this e- eternal value to me and 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 to them. Um, and media will never re- replace that moment of being in that person in that personal presence of an aha moment that is shared between uh, two people. So, how do you think we can o- overcome this uh, suffering, this loneliness? What 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 advice is this book? Of, uh, mm-hmm. Giving us to to overcome the the loneliness we've we've spoken about. Perhaps we've touched on it, but uh, how do you, how do you see the how do you see a healthy future unfolding? Yeah, I um, finished the book off with a meditation on uh, Psalm fifty one, um, and have mercy on me. Oh, pardon. Have uh, have mercy on me, O God, according to your merciful love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. And it, as you go through that Psalm 51, I encourage your um, listeners to read through it. Um, there is uh, this movement of the uh, uh, of the the psalmist looking at himself and the transgressions and the the fear that comes from that. But when he looks to God, he sees merciful love, and the the transgressions wash away. So when when he's looking towards God, the the loneliness, the sinfulness, the isolation evaporates away. And so I think that this is the the moment that our our loneliness will run itself out either in our destruction or into a relationship with God and God alone where where our meaning alone can be found. Um, and so for me, that's in deep prayer of taking time in my day to begin, to let him speak his word over me, that he defines who I am, what this day will be, and uh, desires to to speak to me in the innermost parts of my heart. Um, that um, image of the heart beating is, in a sense, the knocking at the door that Christ speaks about. So daily, hourly, um, every minute, every second, that our heart is beating is an is a knocking of of God at at ourselves uh, to ourselves. That I'm here. I am here. You're chosen. You're mine. Uh, I have an eternal place for you. Um, um, in my room, there are uh, in my Father's house. There are many rooms. Uh, Jesus speaks in the Gospel of of John. There's a there's a place prepared for me in in His home. I do not need to find that anywhere else in. Um, in addictions and isolations, in um, self-destructive uh, behaviors, uh, in communally destructive um, communities, that in um, my heart, here he is speaking to me that this is the place where uh, I can feel his compassion, that I am not, I am not alone, and I no, have no reason to, to fear that he, he is there with me. Wherever I go, he is there with me. So returning to the simplicity of the of the Christian message that Jesus is here in our hearts, uh, th- this is the only the only solution. God alone is our only solution, and that was the the original title of the book, God Alone. Mm. I mean, is there anything we've? There's, there's a lot more going on in the book, of course, but is there anything we've um, glossed over that you uh, you feel is key that you'd like to add in? Um, one really important moment in the book is, uh, confession or what I talk about as the confessional attitude. Um, so, uh, something that, uh, I see humans doing, whether they're Christian or not Christian is confessing, uh, in a sense of speaking about who, who they are. And you can hear it in, in the taxis, you can hear it in the Ubers, you can hear it in the bars. People want to share the, their, their suffering to, to another. Um, uh, you'll never believe what happened today. And you know, speaking, speaking that is just so uh, uh, relieving and essentially human to, to speak the sufferings uh, uh, of your human experience. 
and Christ has taken that into himself. Um, in uh, Adrian's book called Confession, uh, she speaks about the confessional attitude of the son, um, that the, the son is taking all of our humanity in, into himself and confessing that to the father. And so the, the sacrament of, of confession uh, in the uh, Catholic Church is understood as um, Christ uh, speaking, you know, through me to the Father, and the the Father giving me that that absolution uh, by the the power of the Holy Spirit and the and the presence of the the priest and 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 the Church. So that I my confessing has already been taken into uh, the Trinitarian relations uh, at a at a fundamental level, and so my confessing to another is already participating in the presence of God, uh, the Son's relationship to the Father uh, in the love of the Holy Spirit, the compassionate love of the Holy Spirit. So I, I think uh, that has another thing uh, to say about compassion is how do we overcome? We start confessing uh, to each other our, our sufferings. And by sharing that suffering of another, which is the meaning of compassion, to uh, uh, passio suffering come with so compassion is to suffer with and so that can't happen if there's not a confession happening on the other other side so when i share my suffering and you experience it with me as i'm um sharing it uh with you you there then is a feeling for me of being seen and you a feeling um a rhyme of your uh, your own suffering that you then get to get to share. So our confessing to each other is already experiencing the presence of the compassionate God. Hmm. Are you planning on writing any more on Von Spera? Is there already another book in the works? Uh, yeah, I, I this one took a lot out of me. Uh, <laughs> it really is my, I'm so, I can die now um, <laughs> that this book is complete and anything else will be gravy. I really mean that. Um, that of all the things that I've contributed to the theological writing world, this is this is it. I'm so proud of. And but who knows what's in what's in store for me? I know that I want to, and I'm working on a book on the theology of Mary. And so Adrian will be very present in that that theology of of Mary for for today. Um, so there's a short work that I want to do on that. There's also uh, I wanted to do a short biography of of Adrian, an approachable mm -hmm. biography um, that somebody could pick up and get a sense of where where to where to start. Mm -hmm. So the, these two these two works both sound fascinating. Um, so compassionate presence uh, can be found, I imagine, on the Angelica Press website and also um, many other good bookstores. And I'll be sure to link our other discussion in the description below as well as the description for the text. I mean, is there anything you'd like to add before we finish up? I am so grateful to be able to speak to you, James, and, and to your audience. And I love the the podcast and I'm a Patreon uh, and uh, love to hear um, the conversations that you have. And so you're doing the good work. <laughs> Thanks very so much. So thank you. Thank you.